Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Little Rock School District Board of Education meeting for Thursday, March the 28th, 2024. Welcome, everyone. Um, first of all, let me, uh, this is March, so I'm going to talk about March Madness a little bit. We started out, we started out March uh, the 8th with the Lady Tigers. I know it's probably in our celebration, but I was there, so I have a chance to say <laughs> uh, the Lady Tigers winning the 6A overall championships. What about those Little Rock Central Lady Tigers? <laughs> oh, I'm still in your thunder. I, I graduated from Little Rock Central. So the second item was the boys. The boys also won the 6A overall championship on that same night. So want to say congratulations to the girls and to the boys for winning the 6A uh, overall championship basketball. And uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, want to get started? Want to get started, with, Superintendent, with the celebrations of student outcomes? Yes, sir. So good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to all seven of you who afternoon uh, we don't have a VIPS report today so we're going to jump right into our celebrations for the month of March so starting off in case you uh, did not see um, we are proud to share another partnership announcement with UA Little Rock where our students at Metro will be mentored by students and staff at the University in a cybersecurity pathway 
We kicked off the partnership earlier this month. We also introduced Metro's new state-of-the-art cybersecurity lab. The student you see pictured here, there, um, is Traylon Washington, a senior at Little Rock Central High School who has been taking classes at Metro in the networking and cybersecurity pathway. He had an opportunity to learn valuable tech skills and he actually developed a virtual, virtual reality tour of the automotive classroom at Metro along with a racing game embedded in the tour. And he will benefit from his experience at uh, the cybersecurity program at Metro and be attending UALR in the fall. So congratulations to Traylon. <laughs> President Mason has already mentioned this, but we are going to say it again. We cannot say congratulations enough to the Central High Boys and Girls Tigers who made history with their simultaneous appearance at the state championship games earlier this year. It was also the first time the girls team uh, has earned a title. We're extremely proud of both teams as well as their coaches, Brian Ross, who's the boys coach, and Marlon Williams, the girls coach. And by the way, Marlon Williams' picture here, he is also was recently recognized as the All Arkansas Prep Girls Coach of the Year. So congratulations to Coach Williams. Back to Little Rock Central again. <laughs> uh, and we've seen this student many times, has won many accolades, uh, even in my short time here. We can also boast of having one of uh, the outstanding players selected for all Arkansas Preps honors for all four years of his years at Central High School. Congratulations to Enor. Uh, he was also selected in back-to-back -back years as a Gatorade Player of the Year and was nominated as a McDonald's All-American uh, player, and he is also a scholar. I remember several superintendent citations we have awarded him for academic achievements as well. So congratulations to Anor. <laughs> Honor. Does that say it right? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Back to Central again. <laughs> uh, we had a chance to recognize both of these students at uh, the recent superintendent citation this week. Uh, the Central High School wrestling season saw remarkable feats. Tonka Taylor, which is not her real name. I cannot remember. What is her real name? Pam, do you remember? Well, Aaliyah? Aaliyah? Arkea. Arkea Tonka Taylor finished her junior season, so we still have another year with her, as Central's first two-time female state champion with a 35-3 record. So congratulations <laughs> to Miss <Ms>. Taylor. <laughs> Max Mobley pictured next to her also finished his senior year and he was crowned as state champion and voted the 2024 6A most outstanding wrestler of the tournament with a record of 43 and 2. The girls team also made history as state runner up and the boys team placed fifth. Uh, coach Aaron Butler was also named 6A wrestling coach of the year. What a tremendous year for the wrestling team at Central High School. Congratulations to Chef Tara Rainey and Metro Culinary students. The team placed second in the State Pro Star Culinary and State Pro Star Management competitions. Chef Rainey was also awarded Arkansas Pro Star, Pro Star Teacher of the Year through the National Restaurant Association Education Foundation. So congratulations to Chef Rainey and all of her students. Next, we have the robotics team at Roberts. They have earned the right to represent the state at the Global Vex Robotics Competition, which is a huge honor. Way to go, Roberts, and good luck at Globals. <laughs> Moving on to Forest Heights STEM Academy, their foreign language team. Uh, we want to say congratulations to them for their awesome performance at the Arkansas Foreign Teachers Association State Tournament. The team won awards in five categories. In this statewide competition, students must demonstrate their mastery of foreign language in either French, Spanish, German, Chinese, Latin, or Japanese. Quite impressive for these middle school students. Congratulations to that team. <laughs> Shout out to Coach Christian Estrada from Little Rock West School of Innovation for winning Assistant Coach of the Year from the National Speech and Debate Association. Her dedication and leadership have been a driving force behind the success of Wes's for forensics and debates team. So congratulations to Coach Estrada. <laughs> All right, for districts, 40,000 students, one event. LRSD has joined with North Little Rock, Jacksonville North, Plas and Pulaski County Special School District to plan and, uh, and implement a multi-district STEM showcase ahead of the eclipse on April the 8th. The Totality STEM event will take place on April 4th. 
It is not open to the public, but will feature student displays from each district's elementary sites and allow groups of students to visit for a field trip. Additionally, our Academies of Central Arkansas students will serve as volunteer ambassadors at this event, and students from all of these districts will be able to view the featured speakers, including an astronaut via live stream. A huge shout out to Ms. Jennifer Beasley, who has led our efforts in this multi-district project. And we have a couple of reminders about important events coming up. A reminder about the VIPS Evening for the Stars celebration, honoring our outstanding volunteers and parents who support our students and our schools. The ceremony will be held on Tuesday, April the 16th at 6 p.m. at the City Center, 315 North Shackelford. We look forward to seeing and recognizing all of our special honorees. And our last announcement for this evening, we are super excited about hosting, LRC will be hosting our inaugural Black Male Educator Summit Friday and Saturday, May 17th and 16th at the Little Rock Southwest High School. The theme for this event is Shop Talk, Building, communi building Community Through Cutting Edge Conversation, a play on the barbershop theme if you didn't get it. <laughs> uh, the goal is to not only help create an educator pipeline, but to inspire others to create, step up, and to lead initi initiatives across our city and our district that will develop and improve outcomes for black male educators and for black male students in our district. Registration is now open. We began sharing the registration yesterday, so we are encouraging all um, who are interested to register and attend this event, and it is open to anyone who wants to attend. That is it for our celebrations and announcements for March. Can I give one for uh, our, one of our partners? Uh, First Security Bank, uh, of course, uh, they are one of our partners uh, in the district. And uh, with uh, student deposits, we have over $90,000 that have been deposited uh, by Little Rock School District students. And uh, First Security Bank, along with uh, the campuses that have the banks, they were uh, awarded a award um, from Economic Arkansas. And so I think that that is like worth uh, uplifting and uh, sharing as well. Uh, it happened earlier this week. Yeah. Nice. Yes. Awesome. All right. Congratulations. That sounds wonderful. Oh, so we'll move on to our public comments. So uh, this is a place in the agenda when we hear from the public our parents, the stakeholders of friends and friends of LRSD. We'd like to hear your public comment regarding LRSD issues. We allow three minutes for public comments. Our responsibility is to listen to your comments. We are not allowed to respond or to, to engage in discussion, but three minutes is the time. Are you ready, Director Wesley? Sure. Celeste? Um, Both of Good evening, board members and superintendent. I am Celeste Molesby, and I am serve as the teacher librarian at Fulbright Elementary School. First, I really would like to thank you all for everything you do for our district. Um, you all make some really tough decisions, but you do your best at keeping students first, and we appreciate that. I'm here to bring to your attention an excerpt from an email forwarded to you by another esteemed librarian within our district. A principal within LRSD expressed the sentiment that librarians are certified teachers and should be able to handle a class by themselves. However, this fails to recognize the unique demands of the library environment. The librarian is tasked with teaching a lesson while also helping students check in and out books, select books, locate books on a shelf, and all this while other students and staff are coming into the library needing assistance. To illustrate the necessity of adequate staffing in the library, I invite you to envision a scenario. You enter a restaurant where a single individual serves as the host, waitress, chef, busboy, dishwasher, cashier, and manager. This person is responsible for seating guests, taking orders, preparing meals, clearing tables, handling transactions, and managing inventory. Would you expect optimal customer service in such a situation? I think not. Would you be inclined to actually revisit this establishment? Probably not. Now, transpose this scenario onto the school library setting. The library serves as the restaurant, students, teachers, and staff as the diners, and the sole employee as the library media specialist. 
This individual is expected to conduct lessons while simultaneously assisting a sizable number of students in various library tasks, all the while attending to the needs of additional people. Can optimal customer service truly be provided under these circumstances? Do individual students feel adequately supported and valued? Can the librarian effectively fulfill their multifaceted role under such constraints? As a teacher librarian, I can attest to the multitude of responsibilities we bear in our schools in this district. Removing clerical support from our libraries would force us to relinquish many of our responsibilities despite our genuine dedication to fulfilling them. Our students deserve nothing less than our best efforts. I ask you to reconsider the revised staffing formula and the number of library clerks that would be cut from our schools. I ask you to really think about whether we are putting students first. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra? <laughs> Good evening. My name is Sandra Courtois Lawrence, and I'm a National Board Certified Teacher at Otter Creek Elementary in my 25th year with the Little Rock School District. I'm speaking tonight as an advocate for students in my school and our district, and I'm going to be addressing um, item 9.1, the staffing guidelines. In an agreement with Dr. Wright when he took the position of superintendent, it was discussed that the media clerk's position could be kept or even refilled if the library media specialist in the school had been tasked with being the sole support for the building's technology, i.e. the school-wide technology specialist. I hope this agreement is still honored with no stipulation on school enrollment numbers. In Proposal 9.1, it states that the library media clerk position will be eliminated in elementary schools with less than 600 students. Only two elementary schools currently meet this enrollment criteria. This means that the 13 schools that currently have a library media clerk would lose them because of their slightly lower enrollment numbers. This impacts students. And of the 22 elementary library media specialists that were recently surveyed, 20 responded that they are the full-time technology specialists for their school. But all of us are, say they provide instructional technology support on electronics and digital programs that our schools use. The elimination of the library media clerk will impact students. Dr. Wright has stated that everyone has been asked to do more, and I believe so many of us already are. Elementary library media specialists are a group of teachers who, along with their media clerk, impact students. We teach classes, help students develop a love of reading, maintain the largest collection of materials at the school, and all the additional responsibilities that come when we are also the school-wide technology specialist. Supporting and providing PD to staff, and in some cases, even being the testing coordinator, among other duties. Library media specialists are individuals who are required by law to have our library open before and after school as well, which often can't be done without the support of our media clerks. We step up, we see a need, we meet the need. We work hard and often make the job look easy, and people think it is, so they pile more responsibilities on us. We are constantly multitasking and utilizing our media clerk to meet the needs of our students and staff. And with the current staffing proposal, all but two will lose their media clerk. This impacts students. I need to mention that seven of the 22 elementary library media specialists are already in this position, doing all of the work alone, currently without a clerk. That's a quick way to demotivate and burn out a teacher who was responsible for servicing all the students and staff in the building. If we at the Little Rock School District say that literacy growth is our number one goal for students, how can we justify undermining the Library Media Center, its staff, and its programs, which have a direct impact on students and a direct correlation to those students' growth and reading ability? We don't make widgets. We teach little people. Let's always purpose to do what's best for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ernest Banks. So you you want to okay? So, okay. Uh, so Amber, Tiffany, Mary Claire, Mary Claire, and Nikki are speaking for the pavilion on that item. Okay. All right. We'll move on to 
our uh, certified PPC. You ready? I don't really have a report because we will meet, the certified PPC will meet on Monday the 1st. We were originally supposed to meet on the 8th, but due to the solar eclipse, we moved it up a week. So I think I'm just going to wait until after we meet on Monday to bring forth another report because the concerns that are really driving us is what we're supposed to talk about on Monday. So I think that'll be the better route to go. And then I'll see you all back next month. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to our other, uh, we don't have classified, the principal's round table, I guess didn't meet or not pro providing information. Um, we'll move on to a consent agenda. Uh, on the consent agenda, the, is that in? Go on the consent agenda, the um, employee base, um, employee list, that we have, that have like 1,700 names. Um, I would like that pulled from, no, from the consent agenda. Normally then uh, that is reserved for standard um, hirings, releases, blessings of letting them go or um, promotions. And so, uh, so uh, I would like for that to be pulled and so it could be, be, be a standalone. Standalone? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Don't we read the motion with the exception of? Need a motion? Mm -hmm. to pull it? No. Uh, when Just you read the, the motion, motion, you will skip over. I think I'm going to read the motion. Oh, I can read it. I can read the motion. I didn't have the green. The I didn't have the yellow paper up here. It's okay. I'll read your motion. You entertain a motion? I can yes, do it. I'll entertain a motion. All right. So I move that the LRSD school board approve the consent agenda items as follows 5.1 personnel changes, skipping 5.2. Is that correct? I don't what is it? I, I, oh, I I'm sorry. You don't have, I'm sorry. We're it's skipping five here? No, 5-2. Five 5-2, two. Five two, right? We're skipping 5.2? Mm-hmm. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 I'll start over. I move that the LRSD school board approve the consent agenda items as follows. 5.1, personnel changes. 5.3, donation of property. 5.4, Middle School Social Studies Adoption 5.5 Corporate Partner MOU and Direct Admission District Partner MOU and U with UALR 5.6 School Resource Officer Contract with LRPD 5.67 Dr. Miriam G. Lacey K-8 Custodial Services Contract 5.8 MOU with Clinton School of Public Service <clears throat> and 5.9 Purchasing Reports. Thank you. Uh, can I get a second on the motion? It's been moved by Director Wesley, second by Director Callaway. Any other discussions? Yes, there is one. I'm sorry. The 5.9. I'm sorry. It just looks a little different over here. That's, that's fine. I confused that with a policy. Sorry. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other discussions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries consent agenda for the next item on the agenda. Oh, 5.2. Let's move uh, for discussion on the 5.2. Okay. Do you want... Mr. Chair, how do you want to do that? You want me to lean in on that? Yeah, or? yeah. Okay, so with the 5.2 motion, that's, that is a, um, like a pool of names uh, that, is, that is not associated with uh, title, position, location, salary. Um, and so for the board to vote on just names that are not associated with a salary, a position, or location, then that means that we're we are doing a blind vote on that, and <coughs> and that people are able to be moved 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 around at will. So 
Um, my uh, position on this is that uh, it comes back to us once it's built out to where we are not doing a blind vote um, on no matter on positions. So it's over 1,700 names. There are some, some movement in um, some of those positions uh, that was consolidated that appears that they will not be consolidated anymore. So um, just for fidelity, um, accountability, and just making an overall responsible vote to not um, just uh, blanketly, um, and I sent it in the email. So, and so my email basically just uh, talked about how we are not able to um, break it out, understand the rationale. We don't know the, the, the methodology behind uh, s selecting the names. And, uh, I, and the fact that we are, um, some are um, using the, 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 the LEARNS Act no right to be able to move uh, people around and, the, and that the um, procedures have been taken away, the, the protections and things like that. Uh, I think that this will be a, a, a better way of, right, since you have already identified the individuals, uh, associate them with a title position and, and salary. Because, be, be, because the state law, and I'll end on this to see what say ye, of the members is the, uh, the state law is just that we have to provide a contract um, before the new school year. The contracts now they will they 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 will self terminate at the end of the school year, and so it doesn't say we have to per provide a blanket list and have the board vote on it. It just says that we have to um, approve the contracts, and so I have a problem with approving contracts that like we don't know where these people are going and how much we're paying them and what's going on. So I will defer uh, to Ms. Burgess uh, to, to, to give a response. Good evening, board. Good evening. So the list that you see before you are the recommendations for the employment of the initial list. Okay, so this is the first of many that will come before you. Uh, we mirrored the current list to the actual agenda that we always submit to you. The only thing that's different between this list and the, the list that you normally see is that on the current list, it does have some titles and it has the length of the contract. Ms. Hatter is right. There will be some people who will change positions as they do all year, every year. So that's no different. And she's right when she says that the contracts will end on June 30th. Therefore, this is why we're bringing it because with LEARNS, the employees have 30 days to return a contract. We can't issue a new contract until you approve the list of employees. So what will happen tomorrow, if you approve it tonight, is that we will send a letter to each employee saying that the board approved you on, we'll say the 28th or whatever day, and you will have a contract forthcoming uh, the week of April 15th. Then it will generate the contract. Um, as you know, some people may know this, we had an interview process just last night for principals. So yes, we have some people on here who were uh, current in a new position, but they're going to be recommended for something else on April the 11th, so they'll get a new contract. So that happens all year long, so that's nothing new as, as it relates to what they are now to what they may be in 24-25. So it's imperative that we continue to um, approve the list so we can generate the contracts. We can't automatically generate contracts off of after June 30th or any date until you approve the people. Well, I have a different take on that just okay. by talking with other board members um, because, because we are approving contracts. And in this list, even you're right on the fact that it has um, positions and lengths of contracts, mm -hmm. but there's a number of, say, HR employees that are not even on there. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also, um, uh, based on even the email that, 
that the lengthy email emails that went out um, it said that those positions will not be those persons will not be in those said positions and so if you send me a contract and you're telling me that I'm going to be teaching pottery over in Piccadilly elementary or wherever I may not want to teach it pottery even though I might have that certification over at Piccadilly so if we're going to um, truly be intentional about student and campus culture and climate and then we instead of hiding behind learns to be able to move people around at will that is going to have a direct impact on culture and climate because if you have people that are um, not in the position that they said to be because I know you know Pulaski County kind of do what they want they, they kind of just move people however they want to move them but um, with uh, us like if we are going to hold to intentionally having our folks um, in the right positions bare minimum with a contract Vicki Hatter should know that I am teaching civics or whatever um, opposed to teaching something else because there is a need and then I'm just being put here and then I don't even know what the contract's going to say I don't know what my salary is going to be I don't know what my location is and so when then when folks are um, approving contracts whether it's a teacher or a self-employed person or us coming or many vendors who want to come and do business with us and then, and then we are looking at, at the details so how are we expecting to one build morale repair the morale um, uh, repair the distrust mistrust and and and, and the intentional mis, mis, misinformation um, then then and then and then if we're going to blanket give out a blank contract to people and then tell them this is what you got you have 30 days and it is what it is so all I'm saying is for where we're coming back on the 11th uh, we can then, then we can do and read a lot uh, because at one point then we was getting three and four 500 page packets and we was reading those and so um, I, I think that uh, to make a smart vote and not just rubber stamp this thing um, and then, and, and then we need to understand exactly what all we're doing. And then a recommendation is not a contract because some of these people may not even get a contract, depending on what what all they decide or whatever. So I want to attempt to clarify a couple of things. Do you what want me to pull up the email so we can go by that? Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Um, now you made me forget what I was going to say. <laughs> Oh, um, I want to attempt to try to clarify a couple of things. What we're asking the board to do is not to approve a contract. We're asking you to approve uh, approve the people, the employment for 2425, so we can generate contracts to <laughs> offer the employees. The contracts are going to be the same contracts that employees have received. The contracts aren't changing. The terms aren't changing. Um, you see the people. You see the position. You see the contract length. The contracts aren't changing. Um, it's going to be the same contracts that teachers and staff have, have, have always received. We're just now, because of provisions of the Learns Act, we just have to bring the recommendations to the board for them to approve to give us the ability to generate the contracts to send to the employees so that they can decide whether or not they're going to remain with us. So that's what we're asking. That's what we're asking the board to do. But it is, it isn't if, if you're asking us to, and this is just for clarity, because I like n to know I have the right knowledge. But um, if you're asking um, the board to approve, um, I'll just use Lakeitha Austin um, name on, on 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 the as a recommendation. You're recommending her for a contract, and so it's this 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 almost um it put me in the mind of and, and you wasn't here and some of the new folks wasn't here but back in COVID, and then right when we were doing uh COVID leave and it came out that 
our remote workers wouldn't receive COVID pay because of them not being virtual workers. And then we had to figure out what was the difference between the two. And it went from only three people was said to have not to receive that. Then I asked for them to go back and verify that and to bring a definition of the two. And then it ended up being over 80 people that, that would have not received that COVID pay. And so this puts me in my, put, this reminds me of that. Um, and I already know how I'm, I'm gonna vote. I'm gonna vote a no on this one um, because you're asking us to approve a blank check essentially. So, uh, Mr. Adams, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Mason. I'd like to make a motion to approve the employment contract offers for the coming school year. And if there's a second, then I'd like to speak to that motion. Well, are there offers? Well, does someone want to second that? Because I thought there was recommendations and not I contract second the motion. Offers. It's been moved by Director Adams, second by Director Wesley. Thank you, Mr. Mason. So, so the reason that I would, I think this makes sense is um, are, are a couple. One is, you know, in the past, in my understanding, you know, employees who worked here, their, their, their contracts immediately automatically rolled over mm -hmm. and they knew they were going to have a job next year. Because of the Learns Act, these 1,700 or so people do not know yeah. officially that they're going to have a job next year. And there's more people to come that we have to vote on. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, I would want to be able to give them the security and the assurance that they do have a job next year. And I, and I understand that the contract would be based on the salary schedule that has already been approved and that they have and that we've already approved. And, and so I'm not concerned about any ambiguity there because we already have a salary schedule so people know what they're gonna get paid and, and we would know what kind of contract we would be offering them. And we also know that, that we may have to make some shifts as because of students may be different places and, and, and employees of the district are employees of the district and not just of a particular school. And so sometimes we have to move people around in order to meet the needs of students. And, and then they have an opportunity, of course, to accept that contract if it feels like it's the right thing for them. But if they don't and we delay as, as we go on, then that puts the district at a disadvantage too. So one is they don't have a chance to make a decision earlier because the contract is offered to them and then they have a chance to respond. So they know they have a job if they want it. But if we don't make that decision early, then, then some folks could decide later in the process to not, um, that they're gonna go work somewhere else or not work at all. Then that puts us in a place where we have tried to avoid being, where we have vacancies late in the hiring cycle where it's more difficult to find um, a good pool of highly qualified ap applicants. And so I think it's, to me, it's better for the employees on this list, it's better for them to know now that they have a contract that they can consider, and it's better for the district as a whole so that we can deal with whatever vacancies that we may have. So that's why I would speak uh, in favor of the motion. Mm -hmm. Direct, Direct Calloway. I totally agree with you. Uh, we, we, you've never, unless you've ever been to a position where you didn't have a contract. Uh, uh, but this way, because of the Learns Act, we, Little Rock School District did not implement this. This is the people in charge that y'all voted for. And, uh, so I think we need to go ahead with this motion. So let's point okay. order. Uh, Director Strong had a comment. Sure, I was just gonna add to, um, I actually had a school visit set up today and had a bit of a conversation about this with the principal and it sounded like there was a good conversation happening within the schools that she was being very transparent <coughs> with her team and people who were maybe not going to receive a position in her building most likely um, already knew that and you know that, that they were working out their staffing now and they were very excited about that and ready for that. It sounded like a really good process was in place within that structure at least. 
Um, and I will just say as a board member, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to be in the weeds of that. Like I don't need to be in the weeds of how a principal is staffing their building and how we, how we are managing those, those, um, very granular details. That's why we hire the superintendent and he hires a good team yeah. of people to, to do a lot of that work in my eyes. So, um, I am also supportive of, of, of moving this motion forward. Yeah. What I will say on that is that it's not in the weeds or um, are getting order. into uh, a select point of order. Or it, it, it's not getting into point the, of order. The, the, the She's called the for weeds. point of order, which means she want, would like to, for the Go motion ahead. to keep be carried. Okay. And so, like, you do realize you guys are voting on yeah. a recommendation that you're voting blankly on a contract. And so, if someone get moved, no, no I'm, I'm telling you what I, what, what, what it is, because, because the, the con, because I'm reading the emails. These people are going to get moved around. They are being told because of Lawrence, and our superintendent is being advised that we are able to move people around at will. We are what seeing it happening in, in different um, places, but the, the point that I'm making is he made the motion to approve the contract. So this is approving the blank contract for 1,700 people and um, if, 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 if we are going to approve or we're, we're going to move forward with the motion. Superintendent, I sent you an email about a position that that needs to be pulled. And so that position would, would need to be pulled out of this list. So any other Do comments? Want me to the motion, <clears throat> ready for yeah, the motion? For, for ready HR, for the vote? I would. Uh, Chief uh, and compliance officer. I can I uh, go ahead and, and give the definition for a point mm -hmm. of order? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, a point of order is a question raised by a member who believes the rules or customary procedures of the House have been incorrectly applied or overlooked during the proceedings. And when a part of order is called, all discussion it should cease. I understand what you're saying. And I understand what I'm saying as well. But at this point, I feel that we need to, <clears throat> I want everybody to work. Don't get me wrong, you know. But we need to move on. Yes. And, uh, and when you call for an order, that's what that means. Mm -hmm. All right. So I would like to um, revise the, or no, amend the motion yeah. then. Can I amend your motion? No. You, you'd have to make a separate motion, Ms. Hatter, because I'm comfortable with the motion as it's made. Okay, so Superintendent, with let me let me just talk about the position real quick then. So with the position of um, Chief of HR and the compliance, and it being folded into with the um, staff attorney, and and we're hiring a new um, and we're hiring for a staff attorney, which then would remove positions or duties that 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 position will do so are so so will you continue to move forward with that position operating and right in the same capacity once we hire a staff attorney so we're would it be a duplication of services between the staff attorney and the chief of hr yes be, well so what we want you, you put them together i That's put why some aspect yes yeah and so, so we, it would duplication it won't be a complete duplication, but what we are doing is revising or restructuring all of HR because remember there are other positions in HR that have been eliminated and so Ms. Burgess is actually working on new job descriptions for everybody in that particular department. Okay, so my question is speaking position and not one body in the positions. Um, so with, 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 with that position um, salary scale change because this current past year uh, with new positions. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, with, yeah, with the current, with the new positions um, created, it went out way outside of the, 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 uh, the salary scale, which makes our salary scale um, and not accurate and creates a level, uh, it creates a level of dis discrepancy. So my question is bringing, 
how will all that be brought back in line? And this is why I'm saying we don't know what we're being asked to approve um, outside of the, the, the list of names or the pool of names. Um, but that was my question and then about that position because you created that, because that's a new position to the district. So as I said, we are restructuring and writing new job descriptions for pretty much every position in HR. And the chief of HR and compliance will change also once we hire a staff attorney. Not all of those duties were encompassed in that position, but some of them were. Better get majority of it, okay. Um, all right. Okay. Call for the vote. All those in favor of the, of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, board. A uh, February 2024 financial report, Chief Deputy. be before you long here. No. So you all have this in your, your package as well as our LSD board financial update February uh, 24th. Uh, today's March 28th, 24th. So these are always a month behind yeah. as a, the actual financials close out. Going through this summary here, you all have the details back there as well. But this is just a summary where you can find the pages on the PDF here, I'll Zoom here. So as far as our revenue update and summary here, uh, the first uh, bullet here, the one and a half million dollars, that's closed out. It closed out in December, so that's going to continue to carry on. You can see a lot of green here. If you see green on here, that means it's real good. So I like green. You can see a little red here, but not much. Only one there, but. Going down here, our property tax, our second half of the year, because our property tax are collected in, in two cycles from July 1st through December 31st and January 1st through June 30th for our second half year. So our major tax collection usually in the fall around the, the November time frame and in the spring, uh, the April, May. So uh, this will be a pretty boring here until we get to our April and May collections when most of the, the lenders and the escrow companies actually pay for the property taxes there. So that number jump up quite a bit so right now we're only at 7 percent collections uh, along with uh, delinquent property tax so we're about 74 percent collected through uh, February so that's pretty good I think we have about another three I have, I'll pull it up when I get, get to the other part maybe another three million dollars or so that we're expecting on that as far as excess commission like I got louder uh, we, that's green as well so we've uh, <laughs> exceeded that that budget projection as far as our revenue our land redemptions uh, it's not too far off right now, but we'll we'll get some more revenue in and all those other parts. And the interest on unapportioned taxes, that's a part that the actual uh, uh, collector actually, uh, treasury office actually withhold 10% and they have interest on the interest rates are high now. So when they disperse that, it had more interest than we would typically get. So we typically are getting about 5% interest or so on any deposits we have out there. A revenue in lieu of taxes, uh, this was final, so we did come in a little bit under budget on what we actually projected there, uh, 43000 not much. These other greens kind of offset that. And our interest on investment, you can see we're way up right now in the year to date through February. We're almost $700,000 to the deposit based on uh, where our interest rates are. So right now our revenue uh, looks good. I think we'll meet all our aspects as far as what we budgeted out there. So. If any surprises come up, we won't know those till probably April or May, but I don't foresee there being many shortfalls in those collections. As far as expenditure update, oh, any questions on revenue? All right. Oh, um, the, there was a deposit uh, um, that um, districts received a larger amount you spoke about it like two or three months ago that 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 we're getting it in 
um, have had that come in. I know other districts have received it. So have we received ours? As far as tax, I, I, um, it's it's it, it's a separate. It's like a special tax. It's, I want to call it like a refund, but that's not what it's called. You you spoke about it two or three months ago. You may have to prompt my memory. In. I may have to go back and watch that. So okay, usually I'll I, I major tax notes. collection, and we'll kind of see it doing our uh, fund balance. How we have a huge fund balance when we actually get that money in, and it continues to dwindle down till we get our next uh, surge of money, which is typically April, May for the spring. So that pretty much wraps up as far as revenue. As far as the expenditures, we're still tracking. Our patch is at three and a half million. I think we may be closer to anywhere between three and a half and four million dollars operational savings in the salary and benefit accounts due to position elimination and vacant position. We actually are going to realize more than that, but I just put this for operational. So some, some of those are federal uh, funds out there, but we really are identifying our operational savings because that's where we actually have our flexibility on spending it in other places. So you're still looking at those vacant positions out there based on approved staff formulas. I think you all have it before you tonight as well. So as we go through that approved staff formula, if we have any uh, positions out there beyond that, we'll go ahead and take those down accordingly. Uh, areas that we're still monitoring, I'm monitoring, I won't say we, that I'm monitoring, it's classified overtime. We knew overtime. We actually didn't budget overtime on this year because we had so many vacancies out there in the classified, but we knew this category was going to get uh, expended a little bit more just because of those uh, vacancies we have out there. So if you have a shortage of custodians or whoever it might be, you have other people that have to work some overtime to make up that difference out there. The surcharge is uh, basically on any outsourced services we have out there. We have to pay a teacher retirement, so it's a little bit more because we added a few more uh, custodial contracts out there. Other parts are just really going through and, uh, the individual budgets, the software and maintenance support, and actually uh, out reallocating from one uh, object code to another. So not that we actually are over in that unique, uh, that uh, particular department, but just in that category. The biggest one here in this red is gasoline diesel. We encumbered quite a bit of money uh, in our transportation department for gasoline and diesel. It doesn't look like we're going to spend it all, but it's still encumbered, so it still shows a negative there. But we should realize, uh, I think, come in at par on that category. So those are areas we, we're constantly monitoring. As far as our fund balance update, operating fund balance currently close to almost $44 million, $43.7 million now. Uh, that, of course, we're going to keep continuing to spend down on that fund balance till we get our next surge of money in, which is like I said, later on this spring. Capital improvement fund balance, you can notice it's gone from when we originally started reporting to 203 to 64. Uh, we're spending about 10 to $15 million or so a month on that. Uh, very soon, we've been talking with Mr. Tromper at Stevens, and we're gonna have to go out and get the rest of those uh, bond proceeds. We still have about $102 million authorization out there. So most likely uh, it'll be this summer, so we can get that in. We have a lot of projects gonna be finished up and some, a lot of projects coming online as well. Federal fund balance is stable as well. We 65,000, that's on a reimbursable basis. We had some some money left over from the last month. And child nutrition is quite healthy still, as I reported for the last several months out there. She's gonna be spending a lot of that money down. We're actually over the amount we need to be carrying there. So uh, several upgrades in the various cafeterias and kitchens you might see central. I think they just got a new serving line over the spring break. Need some renovations there. Park view is up for one all the secondary being looked at so along with cafeteria and tables as well so just taking a little bit longer to get those things in especially stainless steel and different appliances uh, on back order and getting them fabricated so that pretty much concludes the financial statement summary update any questions uh, <clears throat> I didn't see anything on ESSER funds are we are we uh, out of money uh, yet Yes, almost, yes, just about. <laughs> I'll update that on next month. I didn't put it on here, but we're making some adjustments on our federal funds, so we'll make sure we get that report there. Well, I just wanted to make sure, and I, I think I talked to uh, Superintendent and, and uh, Mr. Ballard about putting out something, what we spend our ESSER money on, because some of the pushback on the funding that we received, some of the school districts received, some didn't do as well as we did. I think we did well. I think we need to let people know, be proactive, and let people know that we we did what we were supposed to do with the ESSA funds, which means HVAC, uh, recycling the air, all the things that that we needed to do with those elder buildings, 
that we needed to do. So yeah. we'll, I think we'll we need to put it out there. Yeah, we'll update you again. So really, we, we had three tranches of money there. The first was called CARES, which is mm -hmm. small. So we mainly all used that for PPE mm -hmm. supplies. Uh, the second part, we did a lot with technology and some of the fresh mm -hmm. air units and different things like that, but a lot of technology at that mm -hmm. point, the Chromebooks and mm -hmm. hot spots and things like that. On the second, it's been more on the instructional learning loss uh, because you had a 20% set aside for that as well. So mm -hmm. a lot of, we did some uh, equipment in there and uh, some HVAC renovation, but a lot of it was on instructional practices and interventions and things like that. But definitely update you on next month. Okay. Got it noted okay. here. Any other questions or comments or concerns? Thank you, sir. All right. Well, I'll stay here. I think the next one is partially mine. <laughs> but I think we have a group here mm. that's here to speak as well. So if you're ready to move on to the outdoor classroom. We that a, we need oh, action. You got yeah, we need there. action on. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. motion. Yes. Mm. Okay. I move that the LRSD School Board of Education approve the February 2024 financial report as presented. I'll second. Okay. It's been moved by Director Wesley. Second by Director Strong. Any other comments, questions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Do y'all announce the next? Yes. Uh, okay. Jefferson Elementary, the main. I have some very important people here. I'm going to let them speak. Uh, yes. Here. <laughs> All right. You have it up. They have a presentation for you as well. Uh, I'm Tiffany Lichka. I am a past president of the Jefferson Elementary BTA, and this is Mary Claire. My name is Mary Claire McLaurin. I'm the parent of a fifth and third grader at Jefferson Elementary School. Uh, last spring, I believe, we came to you and asked for permission to start fundraising for an outdoor pavilion at our school that we are naming in honor of a student who passed away last year. Um, and we're here today to ask you to vote on a resolution that will allow us to sign the contract. We have raised $550,000. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, just, I'm just going to give a, a quick what we raised and then we have our contractor and our architects here to show you what we're planning to build and then we can talk about the resolution. This is our, our smart lawyer person who's going to talk about that. <laughs> um, but as far as fundraising, um, we started last year. I mistakenly thought that we could just build a quick little pavilion for some cash that we had on hand, which turns out not to be true. Um, <laughs> and we raised uh, just private donations, mostly through parents and some community partners uh, in the Kamek area. We raised $550,000. 510 of that we have in cash. Uh, about 40000 is in pledges that should be received over the next 9 to 12 months. Um, and I'm going to give it over to our architects to tell you. They're going to show you what it actually looks like. And then CDI is our contractor, and they're going to talk to you a little bit about Good evening, board. Uh, my name is Ernest Banks. I'm one of the architects along with my team members here, um, Nikki crane Hasty, and Amber Banks. Mm -hmm. uh, today we're just going to give you a quick overview about the design and the design elements. And uh, before that, though, briefly, I'd like to just talk about our, uh, our initial discussions with our clients, which were the, the kids at Jefferson Elementary the School. fourth graders. Yes, yes, <laughs> this, but the now fifth graders. Um, it, was, uh, it was a really great experience. It was a two-day workshop. We just kind of you know, talked to them about you know, what an architect is, um, um, what is design, uh, and how they can be a part of it. And uh, we, just, we, we gave, like, this is just a brief little... Uh, excerpt from the presentation, but like I said, we were just asking them about what is a design professional? Do you understand what these kind of terms are? And I think that you all would be really proud of some of the fourth graders in your district. Um, they are just very, very knowledgeable and also really mindful about um, 
about different elements and how they come together. So it was just a really great two day sort of experience. Um, as you all may know, um, this is Jefferson Elementary. Uh, just from an aerial view, our actual site uh, for the pavilion is on adjacent to the west end of the building. Uh, right here, if you can see my cursor. Um, oh, I'm, oh and, and I'm sorry, this is just some, some photos from that, uh, that two-day workshop. Um, the kids really loved it. They loved being able to participate and actually design their own outdoor classroom. And they all had some really, really wonderful ideas. Just and, and, and like I said, they were very mindful about uh, about design and, and, and accessibility too. Uh, so I'll just go over our pavilion uh, plan at the moment. So our real concept was to split this pavilion into two sides: one where you can play, of course, outside, but also importantly, one where you can learn. And um, if you look at this plan, it's well, and I was actually going to say that idea was generated from the fourth graders themselves. Yes. So not only were they thinking about their own personal needs, but they were thinking there were some students that said, well, some students like to sit off to the side and read instead of play. And some students need to have hydration. And they were also worried about their coach, um, Coach Massey and things like that. So they were very mindful of their own experience as well as their classmates. And we did the best that we could to incorporate their ideas. Absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, the pavilion is adjacent to the west end of the school here. Um, it's really split into two halves. One half is what we call our quiet area, you know, relatively quiet. Uh, it, it's a uh, accessible ramp, green space, uh, where kids can just sit and read and be away from the more active side, which includes a half-court basketball um, um, area and then a large just concrete area for other activities as well. Um, CDI, our, our contractors here, also plan on uh, creating a berm space to overview the larger field within the uh, back area of the uh, playground at Jefferson. And um, this is just a plan, but we can actually get into some images so that it, it can really help you conceptualize what this uh, pavilion is. And actually we have a, uh, a diagram kind of just explain the, uh, explaining the different parts. The pavilion is actually two structures uh, closely joined together to create a butterfly roof uh, to actually separate both sides and provide a lot of shade while the students are outside, which is one thing that the students really wanted was a shaded area to be able to be out there and play and learn. Another thing that they had really commented on and that we found really beautiful was they loved Malin and she had this very artistic spirit. and. This idea of some kind of sculpture kept coming up into play. And so as we sat down after that, we were like, OK, so how do you create a sculpture out of prefab structure? What if it's a butterfly? And this kind of inspiration for us came from those kids thinking about Malin as this butterfly and as a spirit taking off. And so um, it kind of drove really the, the planning structure behind this project. Mm -hmm. So I'll just get into one of our first images. Um, so this is the entry of the pavilion. Um, you'll see a, a wall for potential signage and donor names, as well as this uh, sort of green uh, ramp uh, here. And like I said, the, um, the kids were very, very mindful about accessibility. Um, they had Malin in their class, and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. she was wheelchair bound. Mm -hmm. And so they were very, very mindful to tell us that we wanted there to be areas where anyone can go to and play and be in. So. This is uh, that first image of the entry there. There's actual a portal that you can walk through. And I'll go to the other side. Uh, you're looking at the school here and then the main other play area of the pavilion. Um, and this, this, this pavilion, really, we wanted to, to generate this idea of something that you can move through and play in. And so, so we tried to be very playful with how you move throughout the pavilion. And in addition to that, we wanted to make sure that it was also a learning opportunity. So because there's a butterfly roof, obviously the rain will shed towards the center of it. Mm -hmm. So we took that opportunity to then drain that down to a rain cistern so that they can just learn more about the environment so they can also be an outdoor classroom. So we were talking about we, 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 oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about sorry. that. Yeah, sorry but, about that. But, yeah. um, this is just another view, just slightly angled, of the pavilion just to see more of that broad side of where the uh, half-court basketball uh, court is, as well as a potential viewing area. Some some items within these renderings um, got priced out, but due to donations and everything, uh, uh, we may be able to incorporate some, some more of that stuff back in. Uh, and this is just under the pavilion. We have these colored plant panels that are really fun to be under and experience as well. And really, yeah. we'll let our contractors take it from here. Hello, board.
I'm Jacob Estes. This is Chris Edwards. That team did the hard work. <laughs> we just got to, to really to build do the fun it. stuff and, and figure out how to put it all together. Yeah. Yeah. So we appreciate the opportunity. Extremely happy to be a, a partner in this opportunity. Uh, I personally know the family. Mm -hmm. And um, when this came up, we had no other goal but to make sure we were there and able to bring this to life for the community and the school. And, and all. so uh, I'm not sure if we can just cruise through. I don't want to take up too much time. but. We want everybody to know that this is just like any other project. We treat it we, is with students around, staff, and community. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we want to treat this just like any other project that you have on any of your campuses. We're going to make sure that we've got the children, the staff, and the community first. Mm -hmm. So we'll have all the impl implements of safety in place. So just thank you. We appreciate the opportunity and uh, look forward to uh, bringing this project to life. Neat project for the school, for the family. So I know you, you all have the put together. When will it be put together? So once the contracts are, are in motion, uh, we'll be able to order the structure, and that has a, about a 16-week lead item right now. 16-week, okay. And so that's, that's kind of where we're looking. So we'll back off from there and start our foundations, our earthwork, and things like that. So. Uh, how that affects in the uh, campus will work directly with staff mm -hmm. and the principal and superintendent and make sure that we do not interrupt or interfere okay. uh, because there's still the, the the students still need to communicate to the playground that's beyond that okay. so we'll make make sure we have pathways and things open and, safety. and, and for safety yes yeah. that's that's our that's our main goal in this not only to bring the bring the project to life but make sure that it, it doesn't interfere with anything else so. okay. director Adams Yes, Mr. Mason, I, I would be honored to make the motion to approve this resolution for from the Jefferson PTA for the construction of the Mayland Opitz Outdoor Classroom at Jefferson Elementary. And if we get a second, I'd like to make a comment. I second. Uh, the motion was made by Director Adams and second by Evelyn Calloway and Ann Strong. So <laughs> thank you. I, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, if I have any regret about this whole situation is that I did not get to meet Maylin. I have met her parents and I have met uh, many of her friends and her students and the teachers at Jefferson Elementary. I also knew many of her professional caregivers at Arkansas Children's Hospital. Um, and it's not often that you can say that that people have a 100 percent agreement about what some, who, what somebody is like but Malin did. Um, everybody who knew Malin was um, amazed at her at how she was as a little girl before she became sick and how she faced her illness all the way to the end of her life. And I think that this project is a testimony to her spirit and creativity and care for her friends and her school and in that way, it's also a testimony to the relationships that she had at Jefferson and to the love that she had for that school. Because she wanted, when asked what she would wish for, she wished that the school had a gym, a place for the kids to play. And what a wonderful legacy uh, for her and what an affirmation for the connections that she had at that school and, and what a life can be and what a community can be. So thank you, Jefferson um, students teachers, PTA, for, for all the generosity and work to honor the life of, of this special girl and, and this family. And um, we appreciate all that you've done and continue to do. All right, any other comments, discussion? I just want to say real quick, I, of course, I didn't know Maylin as well. I saw her at school. I just was sitting here reflecting on the celebration of life that they had at the school that rainy, dreary Saturday that I stood out there and was just blown away um, by the stories, the testimonies, the love, the community. And, and um, I remember her parents speaking about wanting to uh, build this pavilion. And uh, it's a special moment today to be here to actually have a chance, for you all to actually have a chance to um, approve this resolution and so uh, this is this is this is awesome this is really really awesome and so I'm glad that uh, much appreciation to the community out at Jefferson for pulling together to make this happen and uh, her memory will live on at that school forever and so it's 
exciting. All right. All, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Resolution passed. Next up is uh, our staffing, FY25, FY25 staffing guidelines. Good evening, board. Before Ms. Burgess comes, I, I want to make a couple of comments uh, uh, with regards to the media clerk's uh, position. We did make um, a change earlier today um, that they were not uh, aware of, but I shared with them that the allocation for media clerk at the elementary is actually 450 not mm -hmm. 600 mm -hmm. and I also wanted to publicly again um, uh, state that we know that our media specialists have many other many of them wear many other hats in terms of technology coordinator some are testing coordinators um, and that commitment that I made for if regardless of what the number or the size of the school is if the media specialist does have other duties, uh, we will continue to commit uh, to making sure that they do have a media clerk. That is not something that could be referenced in the, the chart per se, um, but there is a clause in there that states um, that, I forgot what it says. It says, <laughs> it says specialty positions approved at the discretion of the superintendent and subject to board approval. And that will be one of them. Um, we don't know, uh, of course we can easily find out how many media specialists do have other uh, duties, mm -hmm. um, but, but just wanted to publicly make that commitment. Is that, is that just for elementary? For yes, no, just for elementary. The, the middle and high, they have clerks already. Already. Depending upon, I think it's 600 or more, and they all have more mm -hmm. than 600 kids, so they already have clerks. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so what was the um, rationale behind the last minute um, thought to put the the specialty positions in and, so and not look and and, and, and and not do a and not do a position audit before when all this was brought up all those months ago so the specialty uh, I mean that that provision has always been in it that's not anything new right. what we left off there was the the media clerks the whole line was deleted and we didn't know that until someone pointed it out to us on yesterday um, so that's mm -hmm. when we went back and looked at it and put in and make the changes any other questions yes director strong I just, I just wondered if you could summarize how many schools will not be able to have a media clerk how many elementary schools particularly they're all priority schools so none of our privileged schools have them no they're all, all of our privileged schools will have them but it's only six of them from what I remember how many six do not I know my kids school does not have one at, do what mm -hmm. okay so your media special media or librarian plus. okay Okay. Yeah, we don't have one at my kids' school either. I just, I just wanted, I wanted to make sure with the 450 mm -hmm. rather than, because I had gotten an email about the 600 only being two elementary schools, mm -hmm. and but now with the 450, I didn't know the number for that. So, okay, so you're saying all but six. six. And it's Pulaski County. Um, it's Pulaski part of that? Because I, because I thought you guys had a librarian or. Pulaski a media. Heights does not have a media clerk. No, not Pulaski at all. Heights Elementary. They're, the middle school does, but the elementary school does okay. not. Okay, yeah. and that's what I was confusing. Yeah, really. Pulaski Heights, they're, they're, they have a media, a, a, a librarian, a, yes. a library media specialist. I'm getting my words wrong. At both schools, and then there's a media clerk at the middle school, I believe, also right now. Okay. So, but that should be fine, I think, too, based on the numbers of 500 plus at a middle school. So. Um, I just was curious. Thank you for answering that. You're so welcome. what about the commitment then that you're referencing, Superintendent? So it's those six that you're... It's any, regardless of the size of the school, Okay. any library media specialist who is serving 
as testing coordinator, technology coordinator, other duties, it doesn't matter what the size is. Okay. Um, that's a commitment that we made earlier. Okay. And another commitment that we're working on are the stipends. So those people who are doing technology, some of the elementary people may not be getting that. So our compensation committee, we're working through the uh, stipends for that and that's included in that as well. So we plan on bringing that to you pretty soon. We, I think we're meeting in a couple of weeks to solidify that. So they'll get stipends as well for certain positions. And, 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 and will that be um, exp explicitly spelled out without yes. any guesswork or um, room for interpretation of what that means? Yes, each one of the actual stipends has like a, a job description that goes with it and the committee has been working um, feverishly on it. And so we're almost through tweaking that. So yes, it will be outlined as far as what those stipends entail and what the responsibilities will be. Very good. Awesome. Yep. Any other questions? And this is on the, what about the, um, the register, the attendance um, specialists or clerks or whatever we call the attendance folks and the registrar? Like I've been hearing from them as far as that number of um, uh, some, some schools might lose some based on the number, like Central have like three or four and based on that number, it would have went down. They would have lost one. Um, so have there been any discussion around that? Uh, initially, the discussion has been around the, the list that we talked about earlier as far as the uh, certified and classified. As of right now, no one has been cut. And, but those principals are good as far as advocating for what they need. And then, of course, that can be brought to the superintendent and mm -hmm. made um, a concession for that as well. Oh, okay, so are, so are you saying that uh, the 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 conversation haven't been had or else they are having it I'm sorry I'm, I'm saying that those conversations have been had mm -hmm. ha have been held excuse me mm -hmm. and there are some people on that initial list that you just approved that are registrars attendance clerks mm -hmm. things of that nature so no one has received a letter to my knowledge that they're not returning in those capacities for those position okay. for those positions so okay. And, and, and if I they need be, additional, then we'll have to. I, I want to be very uh, clear and transparent, too, that so I don't know when this document originated. I know there was a 2020 version. Mm -hmm. um, and even in that 2020 version, there were no media specialists mm -hmm. for elementary schools at all. At all. Um, sure. And even some of the other staffing allocations that were there that were, that were board approved, we never really adhered to them. Mm -hmm. So. I know for the 24-25 school year, for all of those clerk positions, secretary positions, register mm -hmm. positions, even if schools are over, we're probably not going to be in a position to deal with that for this year. Um, we're really trying to focus on the, the, the master scheduling, making mm -hmm. sure we have the right number of teachers mm -hmm. per course selection, per enrollment. That's really what we're focusing on right now. We will have probably another year to mm -hmm. work towards getting to what's mm -hmm. been approved that we just hadn't followed. <laughs> so we're not trying to take a, a so I say a hatchet, but we're not just trying to cut out everything mm -hmm. uh, uh, right now. Um, so even if schools are over, we're, we're, and I'm saying probably, I know we're not going to be in a position mm -hmm. to audit all of the secretary, clerk, attendance mm -hmm. positions at all of the schools, but once approved, this is what we will work towards following mm -hmm. uh, and we'll focus on those positions in the 25-26 school year. Mm -hmm. This year we're really trying to be thoughtful around the teacher allocations and the teacher positions mm -hmm. and making sure we do mm -hmm. course selection um, and master scheduling processes mm -hmm. right. Um, and so that's our focus for this upcoming school year. All right, any other discussion? Here we are. Entertain the motion. I move that the LRSD Board of Education approve the FY25 staffing guidelines. Second. Moved by, moved by Director Wesley, second by Director Adams. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the 
next and last item is the proposed change to board policy 7.51 dealing with purchasing authority. And, and the big change here is that last bullet um, that moves the threshold from purchasing district purchasing authority with construction costs from 1 million to 49,999. I looking forward. Did you Kelsey want me to lean in on that yes, since yes, it's yes, mine? Yes, or yes. did you want Kelsey? I'll text them. Oh, oh that's not him. I should put my glasses back on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought that was Kelsey. I did see in a blue suit. Okay, so um, with this, it's a very simple um, policy change. It takes it from uh, being $1, one million dollars um, before it has to come back before the board down to $49,999. Um, surrounding districts, their, their policy is lower than $49,999. So um, I don't know what uh, Chief Deputy Bailey's gonna say, but I can always chime in after him. Um, I, so I don't I don't see what the issue would would be on this one. Even though I know that email went out. Y'all have a question? You just want me to make a comment? Kind of comment on it? Dr. Wright called you up. Okay, gotcha. So I, I know we we put in uh, policy seven point five one maybe two years ago, as we went through and we actually didn't have the construction piece in there uh, with that. I guess threshold, we made it a million dollars, so it's a fairly low threshold for major construction. So I did attach, I think I sent out to Dr. Dr. Wright, probably forwarded out to you all of all the ones under the 50,000, so just for the construction side. So the big part on there uh, right now, the way we issue bid, so anything over 49,000 have to have a formal bid regardless. So before uh, districts could use cooperative purchase agreements, uh, other than a, a CM and actually do things through those cooperative uh, purchase agreement. Over the last uh, probably year or so, it was identified by legislative audit that based on the statute that those should be bidded out. And you have to have certain standards when they get to a certain point, 75 uh, engineer and architects and things like that. Uh, most likely it's gonna, it's gonna be a lot probably coming to you all because we do a lot of, lot of construction projects in that uh, rim, uh, carpet, uh, whatever it might be, that doesn't take much. So if you're carpeting and just say Otter Creek, we're going to probably spend eighty thousand dollars at that point. Uh, only part that causes us probably concern is that the, the timeliness of getting approval, because most of these bids, once you go through the bidding process, they've already uh, submitted a quote form. Uh, those bids only hold for a certain amount of time. Uh, at that point, if they have to hold for an extended period of time, typically those bids are going to come in higher because of the market fluctuation. So right now what they're paying for carpet or what they be, may be paying for structured steel or whatever at that point, if they have to wait 45 or 60 days out, they're gonna hedge those prices a little bit to make sure they cover their, their basis so if they are accepted that the prices hadn't fluctuated. Uh, I don't know what I missed. You didn't mention out, much. Out, out there, so I guess the value added on here, so this is gonna, it's gonna affect, so y'all have to spend quite a bit of time probably going through projects uh, other than the list we're giving you all now, so. Rick Strong. I, I, I absolutely un, I get the, the reason and the justification. I mean, we are in a budget place where we wanna keep an eye on our budget and I am fully there for it. I wondered if maybe we could consider, instead of maybe a flat dollar amount, consider a percentage of a total project cost for this. Like if it is above X dollar and more than, I mean, because in a, a $50,000 change in an overall $100 million project feels very micromanagy, if we've already approved the big picture. But if it is a one point, you know, or an eight hundred thousand dollar change in a fifty million dollar contract, that I mean, I don't, I don't know. I guess what so, I'm saying is, considering like the size of the project and maybe thinking about a percentage, if we want to put 
some sort of cap on this instead of just setting it flat? Because that was, I saw your list, it was a long, or I saw the list Dr. Wright shared, it was a long, long list of things, and I hate to slow up so, projects yeah. when you have like a contract for, I mean, for your example, carpet. I don't know how you do this, but I mean, we do this. Um, but I assume you have like a, a carpet vendor, right? That you have what you expect for the year. But if you have something that happens like everybody gets a bunch of ice and snow and you have to replace carpet, then that's an expected jump, I would assume, right? And so that could easily come back to us to have to be yeah. bid out, right? Or yes. to be approved. So on this, this policy, this Elaborate. is all construction. This is not change orders. So like when we had ice snow, we had the, we had a lot of plumbing issues that go right. around, maybe up it's two hundred two hundred fifty thousand dollars so in that situation this doesn't have a, an emergency caveat at all right. so we had to wait to fix those plumbing issues and some of them were over fifty thousand we have a chiller go out or a, a boiler go out at the school because we have a lot of older chillers and boilers 30 40 50 years old chillers and boilers that are beyond the use of life so if they go out that means there's no hvac or heating and uh, ventilation at that school so in those emergency situations so if you find a, a boiler chiller it's going to typically be 30 to maybe up to a hundred thousand dollars somewhere in between those so those major so we have to wait on those so I think if any policy is put in place you're going to have to have you need emergency clause but in this situation in those emergencies we wouldn't be able to go out and do it otherwise we violate policy if right. we're the legislative audit find us and they look at these policies as we uh, are actually spending it to be an audit finding for us so right. we wouldn't do it right without having to find and if we're going to do it and they expect the legislative finding on it at that point so because the comfortability of the schools would be the change order is totally different I think on that so if you issue when we issue guaranteed maximum price that means that's the guaranteed maximum price that that project is going to be at the worst case scenario there's always contingency built in these projects typically five to ten percent most, most of the time five percent at that point so if you're doing a roof project and you have a five percent contention on there if you ever had a roof a, a major roof like just say central a major building when you start turning off there may be some underlying things that you just don't see on that bid and those are the typically the only time we would actually change it we've changed some on I think the southwest or maybe even the lacy if it was a material similar to maybe this material covering the front here if that couldn't uh, be found in a reasonable amount of time we might substitute the cost is still the same but it's actually a change order a change order comes in many ways of it the child nutrition ordered a uh, whole muscle meat nuggets but they didn't have the whole muscle meat nuggets and they had to substitute that's a change order although the cost didn't change at all it's just a change over that amount of time over that uh, project so Chief but this, this is not the change order this is just for the project so okay yes ma'am so um not to belabor it, but uh, because the email already went out that administration is not supportive of it, so I, I can kind of uh, understand which and in which way this vote is going to uh, go. So um, this is really not about micromanaging. I mean, we keep hearing these um, terms that further take the board out of the business of doing the board's business. That is our job is to oversee budgets and to um, and, 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 and to be able to measure things. Um, one, one thing that I that is uh, a growing uh, appearance or perception is that when it comes down to uh, either safeguarding the district through board policy, and, 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 and administration is, is against it, um, it doesn't go through. Or if it's about pr pr providing a level of privilege or having the, the planning um, policy come, come, come back before us, it's, it's, it's whatever um, administration say to where the board voice is, it's, it's more performance. Um, based off of what is said or done or whatever um, offline. So uh, this is a very simple policy. This is a policy that's been on the books for years. The only thing that changed literally was the amount. And a emergency clause is able to be put in there. It wasn't put in there um, uh, before. And so if that is the crutch, then um, we can put the emergency clause in there again larger districts have with larger budgets is what I'm talking about they have even a, a smaller 
a threshold right then a million dollars. So um, I'm not a big fan of removing uh, duties of, 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 of elected school board or uh, delegating authority um, right of the position. Um, but I, I do think that it is uh, noticeable on and, and then on how things go. And so, like, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, we could move towards vote if there's no Mr. more conversation. Mr. Mr. Uh, Director Adams had a comment. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment um, about a couple of concerns with this. I'm not able to support it in this way as it's presented and for a couple of things. And I think that reason, I think that, you know, good faith people disagree on how granular we go you know, in, in, in where we draw the line about what kind of expenses and how far, far down we go into it. And, um, and for me, I, I haven't um, seen or heard in, in my time on the board something that worries me about the policy and our practices so far, that, that we have been irresponsible or our staff have been irresponsible executing the contracts that we've approved and, um, and handling the things that have come before them. But on a, from a board perspective, my worry, a bigger worry in some ways, is that when I looked at the list of projects that would be $50,000 or above that would come before us, I'm really concerned about the opportunity cost for this board. We have you know, a thousand things we could talk and spend our time on. And we are trying to, sp to spend more time appropriately, I think, on teaching and learning. And, and there's only so much time we have and energy and engagement, and we all know that, that that's limited. And after a while, we don't become as efficient and we, don't, we lose our, and this, this human-wise, we don't have as much focus and we're not our best selves individually and as a group. And so I'm concerned that, that we, the opportunity cost to have to deal with these things, all those other projects, um, would is going to take away our energy and focus on things where we really need to put the greater priority. So, as written, I, I'm not able to support this. You know, um, Director Adams, I do want to let you know this. Uh, Director Vicki Hatter didn't write this policy. This is a policy that's been in place for how many years, um, Chief Deputy? Mm, this only been in place. Since 2017, maybe once they took it no, down. No, this wasn't in place in 20. We actually did this when uh, the board came back. So, so this, when Mike was here. Yes. Okay. Maybe three years. So and, and so and so the only thing that changed was the number. So if you have issues with the policy, then it been there for the four years that 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 we've been here. I've read. It's a, it's a number. Okay, so even with with the city, the city's limit is fifty thousand dollars. Everything that have to come before the board um, or the uh, council. So I just this is part of our job. Our jobs are very simple. Uh, we do fiscal responsibility, accountability, measurement, um, partnerships, co collaborations, um, and this is part of it. it, it it's not just um, approving. Uh, students outcomes and even if we we did really get down into student outcomes and then that means that we would be you know just like I had a, a meeting with Dr. Wright and others and then I asked for um, stu uh, uh, um, school plans for every school in the building in, in the district so we know what the overall plan direction and goal of, of, of those schools um, are to help us shape our overall image in the mind of our, 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 our district because it's hard to operate without a plan. And so, um, not to belabor it, I kind of already knew where it went when it said I am very concerned that the change policy, but it wasn't a concern when we talked. So, um, so I already knew that that was a conditioning of the mind and the mind for the vote. Again, um, this is just another way to safeguard uh, the district and, 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 and have a level of fiscal uh, responsibility, which is one of our duties as <laughs> being an elected school board here. Um, so we could go ahead and get into the vote. 
There was no motion made. Oh, I mean, well, is this a, mo a motion? Oh, you can make it if you want to. Do, do, do. Did you have a comment? I, I, I was going to ask um, just one other, I don't know, maybe I try to be a peacemaker here too much, but um, one of, so there were 97 items on this from FY23, I, I believe, that we would have had to approve that we didn't have to approve ranging 24. from. Do what? That's, that's for this year. For this yeah. for this fiscal year, for ranging from fifty thousand dollars to eight hundred eighty eight thousand dollars. So, I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot on there, and you know, I guess it looks like around um, sixty five four of those were a hundred thousand dollars or more. So, one thing I, I would feel comfortable, you know, supporting. In it maybe I don't I don't want to make a substitute motion. I guess at this point, I haven't really thought through this enough until right this moment, but. Um, but one thing that I might suggest it would be auditing this for a period of time if we are, have any worries about it, uh, maybe getting a report on a quarterly basis of the, the change orders over $50,000 and breaking them out like this. And then if we feel over time that there is something that we are concerned about, maybe we could take um, some additional action with a, an emergency clause in there at a, an appropriate time. I just would hate to hold up projects that are keeping our students the warm, safe, and dry and all the things. Um, so, so, so yeah, we I don't have to do something for appeasement. What, yeah. what, what, what uh, this is very simple leadership. It's, it, um, I can make the motion, um, to and just uh, say ye of the board. Um, I move that the LRSD Board of Education approve the recommended change to policy 7.5.1, decreasing the uh, purchasing authority of the district from one million dollars which is where it's at now before it have to come before the board to forty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents or less so um if, if 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 there's a second then we can um roll the vote So it, it dies and it uh, remains at uh, $1 million before any contract have to come. A uh, purchasing authority, it comes uh, before the uh, board. And so uh, this is your board, Little Rock. Thank you. All right, it dies for like a second. So the next item on the agenda is our board comments. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to um, yet again give a shout out to the strategic planning process. I feel so energized by this, um, and I would like to thank the almost or the over 900 um, community members who completed a survey for the Early Childhood Task Force. Nine, 900 community members and educators, um, over 200 educators, and uh, around 700 um, community members completed that survey. So, um, great data, lots of wonderful opinions. I'm very excited about our collaborative meeting coming up with multiple, all of our task forces coming together and about the work that is ahead of us. I just wanted to share that. I think um, good things are happening um, in our school district. Thanks. And um, and what I will say in my board comment, it will be um, Happy Women's uh, Month. Oftentimes, you know, women are um, charged to lead. Um, I know when we got our board back in 2020, uh, that was one of the charges that um, I was um, blessed to have um, uh, colleagues to say that they wanted me to lead us through Uncharted waters is what the wording was um, when I was board president. And um, my goal was to just kind of sit on the board and understand what it was to be a effective board member. Um, but oftentimes, and then when you're ready, when, when you, oftentimes the times pick you to lead. Um, and, and then you always have to, you have a choice to answer the call or not answer the call. Um, so I was blessed to be able to answer the call. What I will leave you guys with, I want to leave you guys with, with the five characteristics of an effective board member. You know, we have a few things that we do. It's very simple. It's vision and mission, alignment, accountability, 
uh, assessment, co continuous improvement, partnerships and collaborations. And I am proud to say that I have um, been doing most of those uh, with a level of f f fidelity. And, um, and then I always keep a summary of the top 10 statutory duties of a school board. And so I, I, I just want you guys to know that uh, serving the one in, right in this position, I don't take it lightly. Um, and uh, I just want what, what's best for our district. And oftentimes, in the beginning, I would say I criticize my district, I advocated for my district, I organized around the city for my district, but I'm also a huge um, problem solver of my district, right? And, and was blessed to get into a heavy race and win this seat. So um, that's what I wanted to say and, and just say thank you, uh, Little Rock and beyond for all of the messages and, and, and encouragement uh, that you uh, send uh, my way. So I'm here to serve and then I don't take that lightly at all. Thank you, Mr. Mason. I appreciate the comment about uh, National Women's Month, Ms. Hatter, and I want to mention too that uh, March is also Social Work Month and we uh, have three social workers on our board, but more than that, we, there are social workers in our district who are serving students all over this district and all over the school, trying to meet the social, emotional, and the resource needs of our students. And so I wanna give um, some support and a shout out to them and, and the work, the important work that they do all throughout the district. Anyone else? Chair, entertain a motion. I move that we adjourn. Second. Without objection, we are adjourned.